while it's not exactly like what happened on the big screen in Twister over two decades ago, Penn State meteorologists are in the southeast for one of the largest and most comprehensive severe storm field campaigns in the U.S. It's called Perils. When we think of high-end severe weather events, we're talking about supercell storms. Perils, on the other hand, is really looking at lines of storms that have embedded circulation, some of which can be associated with tornadoes. So they've been kind of a, a thorn in the side of forecasters responsible for issuing tornado warnings because the signatures are often not as classical as the ones we commonly associate with tornado formation. PERIL stands for Propagation, Evolution, and Rotation in Linear Storms. So rather than focusing on individual storm cells, the team is looking at what is called a QLCS. The QLCS stands for Quasi-Linear Convective System. It's, it's really a mouthful for what maybe a few decades ago was just referred to as a, a squall line. It's basically a, a line of storms. It can be anywhere from just 50 to 80 miles in length to a few hundred miles in length. And these are probably most often associated with damaging straight line winds and not tornadoes, but on occasion embedded within the line are small scale vortices, some of which can reach tornado strength. And it's challenging predicting those because their development appears almost random. It can be very rapid. More than a dozen partners, including universities, NOAA, and the National Science Foundation, are working together for perils. Various groups have their own niches. That can be an instrument, that can be intellectual expertise, it could be a certain institution has a certain analysis technique that no one else really has. And it's essential that they all work together so that the whole is, is greater than the parts. A lot is happening in the first few thousand feet of a storm. It's an important layer that can help determine if the storm could produce a tornado. But getting data from that layer is a challenge. So we use what are called wind sons, uh, so that the sensor is basically a tiny styrofoam cup uh, that we then attach to a balloon. And inside the cup, we have instrumentation that measures temperature, uh, humidity, and we also get things like wind speed, altitude, and pressure. Most of what we use are pretty small balloons. Um, and, and so they travel, they rise really slowly as they go in the storm. And so that way we can measure temperature and moisture pretty close to the ground. Uh, the challenge comes when the balloons enter precipitation. Uh, when that happens, they get wet, uh, that adds weight to the balloon and they start to plummet back to earth. And so that can be, you want us, the balloons to stay up long enough that you're collecting interesting data, um, but we still want them relatively close to the ground. We don't want them to rise too fast. We want to kind of sample things well in the horizontal. But that means that they might travel a mile downwind before they've even risen about 100 meters. So we need a lot of clearing to launch balloons that have such gentle uh, glide paths going up. Other challenges and perils involve the when of the field campaign. Two of our events, two of the four I've been on, have been basically mid middle of the night, between two and four in the morning. Um, that actually demonstrates the hazards that these QLCS storms can pose because a lot of them develop in the day and then continue producing tornadoes as the night goes on. And it's tough for people to receive warnings overnight. And so in some ways, those cases are the most interesting because uh, understanding nocturnal tornadoes is a, a major question and challenge. Planning out where to be for balloon launches starts well before the storms form. The day before a mission, we are looking very closely at high resolution computer forecasts. These are state of the art that actually resolve individual thunderstorms. So we're trying to see not just where the environments are supportive of severe storms, but where's, where do the models actually produce specific thunderstorms? We, we kind of then know, okay, well, we need to be in this particular area of, of the southeastern states. This year has featured several notable launch days. I think the most memorable uh, field day that we've been out so far uh, was March 24th of this year. Some people may recognize that date. That was the date of the Rolling Forks uh, tornado and, and uh, western Mississippi. We were just uh, a little bit north of there in southeastern Arkansas and uh, we actually were launching balloons into a second thunderstorm that was moving farther north than the thunderstorm that produced that notable tornado. 
um, and it was just north of us. And so it was fascinating to see this storm that was tornado warned, but non-tornadic move just to our north as we were launching balloons into it. 30, 40, sometimes 50 launches in rapid succession of our small balloon borne probe. So these are going up every two to three minutes, where it's just one at a time, steady, steady, steady. But as we're doing that, each of those balloon tracks is carving a, a swath of observations through the storm. And then after the fact, we put all of this together and it gives us a three-dimensional portrayal of what the heck is going on in there. Unlike some of the radar data that other teams are collecting in perils, the WINSON data can't be assessed in real time. That 3D breakdown of the QLCS will take a while to piece together. It's, it's basically assessing where did our balloons go? Did we get them in an interesting spot in the storm? And if we did, uh, what can we learn to be able to better issue or understand when we should issue tornado warnings in the future? Perils has brought scientists from all over the U.S. together to use a sweeping array of instruments in an effort to better understand how tornadoes form in squall lines. And while the field campaign comes to a close, the discoveries and outcomes of perils are far from over. In real life, science takes months, if not years, to just to come up with what looks like a pretty incremental gain in understanding, but those are the incremental gains that are made over the generations that then when you look back 30 years, you're like, wow, yeah, we actually do know a heck of a lot more than we did when I was born or when my parents were born. For Weather World, I'm Rob Lydick.